Welcome everybody uh, to HREI's Technology Day with Bitzer Canada. Uh, Phil Boudreau, Manager of Sales, Technical and Training at Bitzer Canada will be taking attendees through enhanced compressor protection with the Bitzer IQ model. So with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Phil. Phil, take it away. Thank you very much, Loretta. And good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are tuning in from. Uh, so today we are going to discuss the uh, the Bitzer IQ module, which is a solution that is used, of course, with Bitzer compressors. I'm going to talk about the purpose of it, the functions of the module, how it's actually connected uh, into the um, uh, or to the compressor, wired, and so forth. So this is what it looks like, the IQ module, and basically this represents a portion of the terminal box. It's actually a second layer to the terminal box. So you can see that um, uh, you'll see a better kind of view, a side image in a moment, but here's the module itself with all the terminals, which we'll kind of discuss number of inputs and outputs. Um, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll show you actually how that mounts on the compressor so you get a better idea of it. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I think that's where I meant to have this one. So I'll put this one up now. So. <laughs> Basically, this section here, we would refer to as uh, the line voltage section or the, the main compressor voltage section. The IQ module is actually housed in a, a separate, uh, we'll call it a terminal box section or a layer, if you will. That installs on top of the, uh, the higher voltage section, and then the lid goes on top. So that'll add approximately you know, one and three quarter inches to the, uh, to the overall compressor height. So in the past, the uh, or let's just say in, in applications that are that do not use uh, technology such as this, this would be typically uh, what we see with uh, control wiring from the control panel to the compressor. So you've got a main system control panel that has you know relays and controls and all sorts of things, and we have all this interconnecting wiring between the terminal box and the compressor. So you've got power. Of course, we need to power up the compressor. We have a signal for the oil heater. The oil heater or crankcase heater is generally um, oftentimes energized by a normally closed crankcase heater, uh, or sorry, normally closed auxiliary side contact on the, on the compressor contactor. So when the contactor is open, the side contact is closed and the heater is energized, keeping the oil nice and warm during the off cycle. Oil supply monitoring, so your oil flow switch, whether it's pressure or it's optical, um, high pressure switches, head cooling fans, other accessories such as unloading one or two banks, depending on the size of the compressor. Um, then there's the refrigerant injection. So in the past, bits are called this controlled injection cooling, and nowadays it's called refrigerant injection with its incorporation into the IQ module. Okay, we've sent that slide. So with the IQ approach, what this enables us to do is have power to feed the, uh, well, of course we need the power for the compressor. We need a, a power supply. So this would be your control voltage, which will be 115, 120, uh, 208, 230 volt, something like that to the control module itself. Then you have basically a, a set point signal, which basically means you've, you know, the capacity level that you want the compressor to operate at. The great thing about this is now you have a situation here where the module is going to control all the accessories. It knows that the compressor is running. It, it, it receives a run call. Um, it actually tells the compressor to run after it receives a run call and also controls all of these auxiliary accessories. So for example, the oil heater, the module knows that when the, when the uh, compressor is not running that the crankcase heater should be on. So when the run call um, is dismissed, then the oil heater comes on. Um, all of your other functions, algorithms, which I'll get into a little more detail, are all incorporated into the module itself. So this is a look at the uh, Bitzer EcoLine series. Starts at the CE1, uh, which is basically a small two-cylinder reciprocating type compressor, uh, new EcoLine, uh, up to the eight cylinder equal line series. So at the moment, the IQ modules are available for what we call the CE3 series up to the CE8. And just think of that as, as being all of the four cylinder compressors, basically the six cylinders and the eight cylinder compressors is, is really what this means. 
Um, here are the technical specifications for the module. So it's a dual voltage uh, power input. You can operate this on either 115 or 230 volt with a bit of a tolerance there, as you can see. Um, uses uh, 115 or at 115 volt, we would have to fuse this with uh, eight amp fuses. So this is done external to the module, okay? So if you're applying a module like this, these fuses would need to be added. And of course, for 230 volt, then the amperage would, would be, uh, it would drop to four, four amps in this case. Um, some environmental specs, you can see the temperature range. Um, these are all the details that are typical of electronic uh, devices and things like that. So cable connections, um, along the bottom of the strip here, we have the, uh, these are your main, we'll call them, you've got your power input, and then you've got accessories that are controlled at the outputs from the IQ module. These would be your 12 gauge connections here. And then for all the analog inputs, such as the pressure uh, transducers for the suction and discharge, um, they're connected to the block, these blocks over here, which are 16 gauge. Communications is also done through 16 gauge connectors and that sort of thing. So that's how the module is actually uh, laid out in terms of its uh, connection points. The um, RS-485 uh, that we're looking at here also enables, uh, this enables connection with a, a laptop uh, via the best interface uh, adapter, which we'll talk about, the best tool, um, and also allows for Modbus connectivity. So you can actually control and monitor the module using Modbus. In order to control capacity, we would use a uh, apply a zero to 10 volt DC input, so an analog signal uh, to this uh, block known as CN13 here. But of course, if you're using Modbus, you don't need to do that. Modbus controls all of the information to tell the module what to do in terms of capacity control, everything else. Um, so there, there's no need for a separate analog signal when you're using Modbus. So the first thing we'll look at, the first function is what the module does is controls the starting sequence. So once the module receives a run call, um, and obviously this is assuming that the module has been correctly parameterized for the compressor and the type of motor that's in that compressor, because that's going to determine how we start it. Is it a regular you know, part wind start? For example, a Y wound motor part wind start. Is it a delta wound motor um, part wind start? Part wind start? Uh, or is it a Y delta? Of course, there's a big difference. Or is it a soft starter or a VFD? These get programmed into the IQ module so that the IQ module knows what it needs to do at its compressor control outputs. Okay, so one advantage of this is that the timing is controlled within the module. It's set by Bitzer. Uh, Bitzer knows what the timing should be, of course. Um, it's safe. And all you have to do is, is connect your part wind start contactor so you don't have to worry about the auxiliary uh, side contacts and time delay relays and things like that. Again, one of the main features of the module is that it greatly reduces the uh, amount of wiring. And of course, with more wiring, it does introduce that there's a greater possibility for errors to occur. Um, so this uh, helps reduce that possibility. Some other things that the IQ module does is it monitors the motor uh, for overload. So in a thermally protected motor, we have PTC sensors that are embedded in the winding. So each winding has a PTC sensor. If it has the motor has three windings in it, it has three sensors. If it has six windings in it, which uh, many, many compressors do, uh, then they'll have six because we need to protect each and every uh, monitor, each and every one of those windings. Any one of those windings overheats, then a PTC sensor, the resistance is gonna ramp up very quickly, reach a threshold, and any one of those sensors can take the uh, compressor offline. That's what the traditional uh, control that is, is included with the uh, Bitzer compressor. So the IQ module actually replaces that, that um, functionality of the typical SEB type modules. And this is, so this is built into the module. So, you know, once your uh, resistance loop reaches four and a half thousand ohms, uh, then this will indicate to the module that something's going on and we better shut the compressor off to protect it. Also monitors oil, whether it's a, you know, an oil level type uh, compressor. So for example, the compressors that have the dynamic disc or the slinger disc, uh, as they're sometimes called, 
uh, where there's no oil pump. Uh, these need to be monitored for oil level. Uh, with compressors that have oil pumps, they're monitored using a differential pressure switch. And with the differential pressure switch, of course, and I, this is a pretty typical number, once the pressure uh, differential drops below 10 PSI, um, then the module is going to uh, time out. The discharge gas temperature sensor, um, this is also monitored by the IQ module, but instead of uh, the, the, the previous approach was to use an SEB standard module in the compressor terminal box, where you would wire the motor PTC sensors in series with the discharge sensor. Um, uh, and, and that works. It's, it's very effective, of course, but if something trips, we, we don't really know exactly what that is, unless you have two modules uh, wired in, of course. So with the IQ module, we have dedicated inputs for the motor temperature sensors and for the discharge temperature as well. Here's a look at the envelope because the, the uh, module when parameterized as such will offer envelope monitoring as well. So you can see the different levels of alarms and warnings and things like that. So basically we look at, uh, we have the dark black uh, line here bolded is the standard, we'll call it the, the released um, envelope for the compressor. And as we start working, let's simulate an increasing evaporating pressure here. Once we reach this dotted green line here, we, um, that, that's actually known as a, as a warning reset. So if we keep going, reach the warning limit, then the module will indicate a warning that your evaporating pressure is, is getting pretty high. We're starting to approach the edge of the envelope. If the evaporating pressure then drops back off, then we'll reach the warning reset, and then that warning goes away. However, if the evaporating pressure continues to increase uh, to this point, so we have this uh, red, uh, the red dotted line is known as a critical uh, limit, then the module will uh, take the uh, compressor offline because we're outside the envelope, but it will allow it to come back on after a certain amount of time. Um, however, if the compressor reaches the outer, the very outer limits here, um, that, that indicates a fault. And in this case, the compressor is taken offline and requires um, a reset, okay? So this is basically how it works. That would, of, of, of course, apply for increasing condensing pressures, decreasing evaporating pressures, and decreasing condensing pressures. Anything that pushes the compressor outside its intended envelope. So, of course, when compressors start up, it takes, you know, does take some time uh, to bring it into the envelope. Uh, basically, the envelope is, let's just say it's, it's kind of ignored for 120 seconds after startup, just to allow the, uh, the pressures to pull down in the evaporator and increase in the, um, in the discharge. Okay, so it'll look, may look something, something like this where we come into the window or the envelope. Um, there are, are also high pressure, low pressure adjustable um, settings inside the IQ module. Uh, or in the software that you can you can program into the IQ module that uh, you know that can be configured. But um, um, these are basically settings that you would program in the event that you want to have you want to have early indication of of a low pressure issue or high pressure issue. In other words, these are not safety cutouts, particularly the high pressure control. Um, we're not using the internal high pressure setting to take out the high pressure switch. Um, and that wouldn't be acceptable and, uh, by safety authorities anyways. The high pressure switch always needs to be wired in series with the uh, compressor contactor, basically. Additional cooling is another thing that's controlled by the IQ module. So it, the IQ module, by means of, uh, well, by through sensing the discharge temperature sensor here, knows when the compressor is starting to run a little too warm and will turn on the uh, head cooling fan if it exists. Now, when the software is parameterized, you have to let it know that there is in fact a head cooling fan. Um, that way it, 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 it knows. We, we need to program all these accessories into the module so that it knows what it's controlling and knows how to, uh, to control them all together. So the discharge, uh, sorry, the condenser head, uh, the uh, head cooling fan rather will be, um, 
will be cycled on at approximately, well, it's 248 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 120 degrees C, and then back off at 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees C. Note that for low temperature applications now, we're not running the head cooling fan all the time. There's no need for it. Um, low temp compressors oftentimes can actually operate through winter months, nice low condensing temperature. Uh, that head cooling fan may not even need to be running. So it's really an on-demand situation here where if the head cooling fan's needed, it's brought on. Another algorithm built into the IQ module is refrigerant injection. As I mentioned, this replaces the legacy controlled in injection cooling uh, control, which is an external controller uh, that was used. Now all of this is built into the IQ module. And I think there's a great advantage in having one smart module controlling all of your accessories because it has access to all the inputs. And it knows if the compressor is being too foot pushed too far. For example, with unloading, if you try and unload it too far, the module just may not let you because you're pushing the compressor too far. So really a great form of protection. And I mentioned the heater before. Compressors running, if there's a run call, the module knows to turn the heater off. And once the run call is finished, then the heater is brought back on in order to limit the amount of uh, refrigerant migration into the compressor's oil in the crankcase. So now I'm gonna introduce you to a, a feature known as very step unloading. So traditionally with unloading, you would connect these to uh, the unloaders to pressure controls, maybe temperature controls in, in some cases. And then the unloader would, be, would simply be um, energized in order to reduce the capacity of the compressor. So bits are used as what, what are known as suction cutoff unloaders. So in this case, you can, you can see this unloader is actually in its cutoff position because the suction gas can't get into the cylinder here because the piston is, is closed. That's because discharge gas from the, uh, from the uh, high uh, side of the compressor, the discharge gallery, is actually forcing the piston downwards. Okay, so in this case, the compressor is unloaded. And of course, two, two pistons would be, or two cylinders are, are unloaded with each unloader. And in the past, you would have, you know, with a four cylinder compressor, you could have one unloader. Um, you can operate uh, both heads loaded or just have one bank of two cylinders uh, loaded. Uh, with the six cylinder compressor, similarly, you could unload up to two cylinders, or sorry, two heads, okay? So that would be four cylinders in total. And that was traditionally how it was done. So you'd have steps. You'd go from, you know, on the four cylinder, 50 to 100. If you want to unload, you're going back to 50. There is no in between. Similarly with the, uh, the six cylinder, 33, 66, and 100, but nothing in between. In, back in 2013, the CR2 unloaders were introduced by Bitzer. And basically these are modified unloaders that enable... Uh, quicker operation, quicker response, if you will, so that when they're energized, they get the job done quicker. And when they're de-energized, they can move back into an unloaded position quicker. Okay, this just involved the component change and uh, setup change basically inside the unloader itself. So new unloader stem design, basically. Uh, so these can be cycled more, more frequently, which gives us more flexibility in terms of uh, capacity control, which we'll talk more about uh, so the operation of these unloaders is basically the same as what took place in the past. We can just cycle them more often. Of course, with unloading, and this really is a point that uh, is, is not specific to IQ module applications using the CR2 unloading algorithm, but also uh, compressors, bits or compressors that have unloaders uh, just in general is that we always have to respect the application limit. So uh, I always like to say, just because you can unload a compressor doesn't mean you should. Um, depends on the compression ratio you're operating at, the refrigerant you're running. Um, and there's other things that need to be considered as well, uh, pipe sizing and flow through evaporators and things like that. But it can be done. So if the system is actually designed with the components that can get the job done, the, the IQ module can certainly uh, support this. So in Bitzer Canada's case here, um, by default, all four cylinder compressors have one unloadable head. 
Six cylinder compressors have two unloadable heads, eight cylinder have two unloadable heads, but you can also order these compressors with um, the four cylinder compressors. For example, you can get two unloaders. So you can unload all cylinders, short periods of time, but you can unload them. Six cylinder compressors, you can actually unload up to three heads. And with the eight cylinder compressors, you can unload up to, um, uh, up to uh, two heads. Okay, but the compressors would need to have that additional head. So if you want to do a little more unloading than what the the default delivery extent offers, then the compressors would have to be ordered with the additional unloadable head. So most compressors in the field that have the current version of the unloaders, known as the CR2, as opposed to the CR1, is which which is what they were called in the past. Um, these were or CR. I think they're actually just called CR. Um, they were controlled the same as with the former unloaders, meaning that they were pressure control standard, you know, reverse acting low pressure switch, for example, would be used when the pressure goes low energy, the, the unloader would get energized to put it into an unloading state. Um, and the reason, the reason for this, why so many of the newer control uh, or unloaders are controlled this way is because there's very few third party co controllers that can, can actually control the compressor reliably and safely. Um, and I guess those two terms go hand in hand, um, safely safely for the compressor and, and reliab reliably. Uh, we don't wanna run into oil issues, overheating issues, you know, things like that. So um, in the past, Bitzer did not actually offer a standalone controller for this purpose, but um, the, uh, I guess you could say the introducing the CR2 was the first step in enabling algorithms to operate on loaders uh, more frequently. Higher cycle duties, in other words. So the unloading algorithm nowadays that's offered is in the IQ module and it's uh, been fully tested in Germany uh, for actually quite a, quite a long period of time, uh, likely with different refrigerants, many different compressors and the algorithms are, are really catered well to the compressors. So to control the unloading, we have uh, this control strip here on the terminal strip. As I mentioned on the 12 gauge uh, uh, strip at the bottom here, we have some control outputs and you can see that the module here may be hard for you to see, but CR, CR2-1, CR2-2 and CR2-3, and then there's neutrals. These are simply your outputs. It's as simple as tying the unloaders, solenoid coils, into these outputs and let the module take over the control. You just have to tell the module what type of capacity level you want, and then the module will control the unloaders accordingly. So here's a compressor that's actually set up with a, an IQ module. It's got a head cooling fan. Um, it's actually got two unloaders in this case. Um, has an oil level regulator. These are not available in North America, but you can use an electronic oil level regulator and tie it into the IQ module. Uh, you know, We can discuss that if you have an application for it. Um, I suspect that at some point, uh, these will be available for North, the North American market also. Pressure transducers here. In this case, this uh, compressor uses an optical sensor that's tied in, and then we have a crankcase heater, all tied back to the module. So again, there is no interconnecting of these accessories back to the terminal box. This is all handled by the, um, this is all handled by the uh, IQ module, so. You know, the, the IQ module can also handle start unloading, not really something we use here in, in North America a whole lot, but it is something that's available. The most common approach is gonna be the CR2 unloaders um, that you're gonna use to uh, control the capacity of the compressor. So this slide just gives us an example of operating envelopes. Um, you know, if you take a look at uh, um, compressors that, that uh, operate at, at low compression ratios, you can see that, you know, it's, it's, this is open territory here where we're not experiencing the thermal limits that a compressor can see where a head cooling fan uh, or, you know, and in some cases, uh, maybe even liquid injection also needs to be applied to that. Uh, it depends. And generally the more unloading that you do and the higher the compression ratio, the warmer the discharge gas gets. So the module will be main will be monitoring this. And like I said before, it may limit how much unloading you can do. Uh, so for example, let's say a head cooling fan fails or something like that, 
and the compressor continues to get warm, it's not going to allow the compressor to, uh, to operate uh, hot. It will shut it down before this happens. So for the capacity control, we have uh, an analog signal. Um, unless you're using Modbus, you'd have a zero to, a zero to 10 volt DC signal um, at the input to the terminals that I had shown you before. So um, in some cases you can operate a compressor, for example, I would say a, a low compression ratio type application. Uh, generally speaking, you can operate that from 10 to 100%. And in this case, we're, you know, just cycling unloaders. And interesting, interestingly, when we do it this way, the module is also reversing the solenoids as well as needed to kind of share the, the workload, if you will, so that it's not the same one that's pulsing most of the time. So the bits are opti optimized algorithm results in, in best efficiency, really good control um, of the compressor based on the capacity step that uh, your control system is actually looking for. And because we're, we're cycling the unloaders more often, it results in, in reduced uh, or minimal pressure fluctuations um, because the, we've got very good control. And when these modules are, are applied to compressors, oftentimes pressure transducers are connected to them as well, which is the way I always recommend connecting them because you've got, then you've got access to envelope monitoring. Then the, the IQ module essentially knows everything that's going on with that compressor and can protect it as needed. And as I mentioned before, it's going to cycle the head cooling fan as needed. So there's no need to run a head cooling fan all the time if the compressor is not running uh, excessively high discharge temperatures, uh, no need to waste that 50 watts of energy or so, or whatever that is, you know, times the number of compressors that you have on a system or on a rack or in a building. The, um, as I mentioned, the unloading valves are, uh, the cycling is equalized in order to maximize valve life. So that's just another way of saying we're not uh, cycling the same unloader all the time. We tend to, you know, reverse them back and forth. And, uh, but no, of course, in order to get down to 10%, you need to cycle both unloaders on a, uh, on a four cylinder compressor. So, and then the module enforces the mechanical boundary limits to ensure longest compressor and CR2 uh, valve life, your unloader life. So I had explained the connections on the IQ module and how you connect the unloading to it. Uh, with the uh, traditional method, you would have your control panel um, with individual wires coming out perhaps that are tied into low pressure controls, or maybe these wires come directly in from reverse acting low pressure controls that are connected to a system. And then these will be used to cycle the, the unloaders as needed. So now this is what it looks like. We power up the module, okay? And we have a run call for the compressor. Then we have a, an input, an analog input, unless it's Modbus being used, zero to 10 volts, depending on the level of, of analog signal that exists at these input terminals will determine which solenoids are going to be cycled on and off and the module looks after all of this inside. So again, greatly simplified wiring, reduces the chance for wiring errors, that sort of thing. So many applications uh, require liquid injection uh, or refrigerant injection as it's called, uh, because a head cooling fan is just not going to be effective enough. So in addition to the head cooling fan, we can apply um, refrigerant injection using the IQ module. And if you do need refrigerant injection, uh, the IQ module is needed uh, either way. Uh, so the, it, it, it really is, uh, as I said, the IQ module replaces the CIC uh, uh, control. So if a refrigerant injection application is, is required, then the IQ module is also required in order to control the uh, refrigerant injection solenoid. So for example, lower temp applications, 407A, 407F, 448A, 449A, other refrigerants that operate at you know, fairly high discharge temperatures, um, any refrigerant's gonna operate higher discharge temperatures as compression ratios increase, but this is also refrigerant specific, of course. 
Um, if you've got systems with high return gas superheats, if you've got systems where uh, perhaps a head cooling fan is just not practical, so the compressor is mounted in an enclosure in a, in a cabinet or something and, um, and there is no ventilation taking place, then uh, it's just not practical for whatever reason, then this is something that, that can be done. And I recommend that uh, you would contact Bitzer about such applications like this. Uh, first and foremost, we do recommend using the head cooling fan first. If needed, the liquid injection comes on as a second stage. So this liquid injection, refrigerant injection increases compressor availability, meaning keeping it online and um, extending the envelope to some extent um, because you can operate lower saturated suction temperatures in some case, cases where you wouldn't be able to otherwise without liquid injection. Permits higher suction superheats, necessary evil, uh, you know, due to piping lengths and plant layout and so forth. Permits uh, uh, relatively high uh, capacity turndown um, and it, as I mentioned, extended envelope. So that's primarily on the bottom end or we'll call it the lower saturated suction temperature we move towards the, the bottom of the, uh, the envelope. So here's an example. A typical envelope for this compressor would look something like this. I'm just outlining it here with the pointer and with the refrigerant injection, the extended envelope actually looks like this. So uh, of course we don't wanna operate the compressor in a vacuum being a semi-hermetic compressor. So that's basically the main, you know, this is the main factor that determines what your uh, lowest evaporating temperature is. So as you can see, that's probably minus 49 Fahrenheit or something like that, close to minus, minus 50 down here. So again, the IQ module is the solution for uh, the, the new refrigerants in, in lower temp applications. And we experienced this years ago with R22, of course, R22 operated at, at quite high discharge temperatures. And now with some of the alternative replacements, they operate at higher discharge temperatures or tend to operate at higher discharge temperatures than their predecessors, which were 404 and 507 which of course replaced R22 um, in, in lower temperature applications. So in some ways you could say that refrigerant injection has kind of made a bit of a, a bit of a comeback. So, but it's okay, the IQ module looks after all of this for us. So more notes about the uh, about refrigerant injection, provides control of discharge temperature, of course. Now the IQ module always comes with a discharge sensor, it's not, an option, it's, it's actually included. Um, the wiring harness is already connected for the discharge sensor. You simply install the discharge sensor into the compressor, connect the uh, wiring uh, harness to screw on type uh, connector and away you go. Now the IQ module has access to discharge temperature, uses that for uh, the head cooling fan algorithm, when to cycle that on and off, refrigerant injection um, and other things. Even on loading and all that is all, all of these are controlled um, simultaneously and monitored. Faster, shorter injection pulses, which I think is pretty important. See one thing with uh, any compressor lubricated by oil, which is most, uh, refrigerant does tend to have an influence on the lubrication ability, the tribology characteristics, if, if you will, of the oil that's in the compressor, the more refrigerant you put in that oil, it's going to dilute it down, reducing its viscosity, reducing the available lubrication, that sort of thing, possibly even increasing oil carryover, uh, things like that. At the end of the day, it reduces reliability, reduces compressor life, that sort of thing. So it's really important that the algorithm for refrigerant injection is done uh, so that the refrigerant is, is atomized into the compressor in a safe manner. Uh, and we don't want to do too much of it. We want to just add just enough to, to keep the compressor sufficiently cool. And also, we don't want it to have uh, too much of an impact on, on system pressures. So specifically the suction, which is where you're injecting the liquid uh, refrigerant. So. With, the new, uh, with this new approach, uh, Bitzer has increased the maximum discharge gas temperature only when the IQ module is used up to 150 degrees um, uh, C, 
uh, instead of the traditional, the 140 C. So 140 C is 284 degrees Fahrenheit. 150 C is 302. So another uh, 18 degrees or so um, R of additional um, temperature increases is allowable. Controlling and monitoring of the refrigerant injection, unloading, head cooling fan, discharge gas temperature, um, everything are all monitored, controlled together in concert. So this refrigerant injection, as I mentioned before, is released for current low temp refrigerants um, used. And this is not an exhaustive list to be clear, okay? There, and there's some refrigerants that are just not listed in the software. In fact, not, and they're not listed in, in the best software. So in these situations, you'll, you would have to contact uh, Bitzer so we can uh, evaluate the application. But um, for sure, 407A, 407F, 448A, 449A, uh, and a few others are in the list and built into the, uh, to the, uh, the algorithm. So you parameterize the IQ module via the best software, and you would tell the best software what the compressor is, what the refrigerant is it's using, how many unloaders do you have? Are we using liquid injection? Do we have a head cooling fan? Um, and that sort of thing. And I don't believe there's anything asked about the crankcase heater. Um, well, um, and perhaps, well, it, in my view anyways, all compressors should have crankcase heaters in them uh, because refrigerant will always migrate to the oil, even when the refrigerant temperature and oil temperature are the same, a difference in vapor pressures, the refrigerant is going to migrate in there. And even with a heater on, on the crankcase, you're gonna have some refrigerant in there, but the point is to limit the amount of refrigerant migration to that oil. So here was the past approach to refrigerant injection using the controlled injection cooling module. Uh, you have all your safeties here, and then you've got the, the liquid injection module, uh, pressure controls, overloads, everything else. And then, um, and then we would control the uh, liquid injection solenoid uh, with the with the CIC module here. So it would look something like that. With the IQ approach, again, um, obviously the module needs to be powered up and it has a run call and you're controlling, the module controls the compressor contactor or contactors if it's a part wind start type application. Um, and then it's as simple as wiring in the two wires from the injection solenoid back to the IQ module. Uh, when the IQ module determines that liquid injection is needed, then it will be energized and we start up the refrigerant injection process in a pulsing manner, as I mentioned before. The IQ module offers different connectivity methods. Uh, so for example, Bluetooth is one, USB is one. Uh, Modbus, I mentioned, uh, Modbus is, uh, is generally gonna be something that you use when you wanna control the compressor from a, a central system. So you would have the uh, central controller actually send Modbus signals through a two wire interface to the IQ module and it'll tell it to run. It'll tell it what capacity step to be at. And at the, at the same time, the IQ module will then upload or report various operating conditions of, of the compressor um, if you have pressure transducers installed, it'll, it'll report what your pressures are, um, temperatures that it's monitoring, um, unloader states, refrigerant injection state, is the head cooling fan on or off, things like that. Alarm conditions, which is probably the most important thing to report back to the host system. These will be reported via Modbus as well. What's really cool, um, about the IQ module is that a service technician can simply connect to the IQ module using a smart device, um, you know, such as a, uh, an iPhone or Android type device, connect to it, and then you have access to what's inside that module. What is it seeing? What's it experiencing? What are the operating conditions of the compressor? Has it tripped off? What was the reason it tripped off? Has it been tripping off for a few cycles now, has it, has it tripped off on multiple oil failures, for example? 
Um, if that's the case, the technician has easy access to this information. So the Bluetooth is one way to do it. And it doesn't have to be a smartphone. You can simply do this with, a, um, with your laptop, just connect to it via, via Bluetooth. Um, however, you can also hardwire um, your laptop into the communication port of the module, which I had shown you before. It would involve taking the lid off the compressor and then you would plug in the, uh, the appropriate connector. Um, and then there's a, um, uh, uh, your RS-485 uh, to USB um, type adapter here and a cable. And that enables us to connect to the computer. So then we can open the best software and we can, uh, we can communicate with the module. Some of the features that the uh, best software offers, this is actually a screenshot of, uh, well, a, a graphical image, I guess, of the uh, best software in operation, reporting information that it collects from an IQ module. Um, so we have um, things like, it's recording pressures, but because you program the pressure, uh, sorry, the refrigerant type in, it'll also translate this to the saturated suction temperature for the compressor and the saturated discharge temperature. We'll also uh, uh, record your discharge temperature and show you how it's doing. Um, and there's other things you can add to the tables. You can, you can actually customize this so that you can have um, certain uh, operating conditions displayed or not displayed. So really cool, really flexible. Getting back to the smart app, just to give you an idea what you would see when you open up the app. You would connect to a compressor. This particular image just shows it's connected to a, um, uh, a demo unit, but you would just put the, um, the app into a non-demo mode where you're gonna to connect to a real device. Then you, as usual, when you're looking for Bluetooth device, look for the IQ module. And once you connect with it, then the screen will be populated with this type of information here. Right off the bat, you'll see, in this case, the compressor's running what the evaporating temperature is, condensing temperature, what's the discharge temperature, what is the capacity regulation set point, and what is the actual compressor load? So um, you may be wondering what that is. The compressor load is actually something that's always gonna be trying to catch up with the set point. So when you change a set point, say from 100% to 50%, it's not gonna go there right away. Um, slow change is always better, it's better for, the expansion valves and regulators and everything else in the compressor. It's better in general because um, it also reduces the possibility of oil foaming. Gradual pressure change is always better than rapid pressure changes. So it will take some time for that, uh, for the actual unloaders or the, to, to bring the compressor down to that 50% state because the IQ module is going to control the speed at which it, it ramps down to that, that 50%. Other than that, there's, we have access to, uh, you know, your, they call it evaporating temperature, which is really your saturated suction temperature at the compressor. Condensing temperature, again, really the saturated discharge temperature at the compressor. The actual discharge temperature, uh, regulation set point, um, information about the compressor, model, serial number, but all of this has to be programmed into the, um, into the IQ module via the best software when you configure it for the first time. And I, I can tell you um, the best software is super easy to use, very easy to program a module. We can walk you through it, you know, the first time or two. Um, I'm sure you'll pick it up uh, super quick, very intuitive, easy tool to use. Here we can see what auxiliary outputs are actually being controlled. So we know the compressor is running and you can see here the Oil heater active, this is false. So it's the heater's not on because the compressor's running. In this case, the head cooling fan happens to be on. Okay, well, we can see the discharge gas temperature is 276 degrees Fahrenheit approximately. So that's why the head cooling fan's running. So it gives you a lot of access uh, or a lot, uh, it gives you access rather to a lot of information. So, you know, even things like alarms. Well, fortunately in this case, there were no alarms, but there are many different types of alarms uh, very self-explanatory, you know, let you know if your suction pressure, you're, you're running the compressor, uh, suction pressure too low, too high. Same with your uh, discharge pressure, discharge temperatures, um, oil issues, things like that. Even things uh, that you may not think about, like compressors running without a run call. 
maybe there's a, a contactor head welded shut, something like that. But you've got something that's always monitoring that compressor uh, to make sure it's being protected all the time, all the time. So this is just an example I put together of, uh, it's just a, a little program I wrote in um, uh, C Sharp for Windows. So I can connect to a module. Um, I wasn't 100% sure how to make this work quickly, interactively. So I just give you a screenshot here but it shows the same kind of information we just saw. But the, the point in showing you this is that any main control system can be used or configured, programmed to control the IQ module and monitor its outputs. Okay, and um, in this case, using the uh, Modbus information, which is actually embedded into the best software, it explains everything about using the Modbus, how to connect, how to terminate, your uh, connections, um, what memory addresses you need to access to determine the, the uh, status of your crankcase heater, head cooling fan, and so forth. Um, and then here I'm just displaying alarms as they come in via Modbus. So uh, it's, it's a pretty cool setup. And one thing I didn't mention was the indicator lights. So you've got you know power light, you've got a warning light, fault lights, comp, uh, com for communication. So the blue will mean that you're connected via Bluetooth or via Modbus. And which way are you connected? Could be both actually, of course, but um, these lights may uh, flash. There may be a, a slow pulse rate or a fast pulse rate. And in the instructions, they explain what the different pulse rates are, what they mean, just so you have a better understanding how it works. Another option available when connecting to IQ modules is what's known as the Bitzer Digital Network. Uh, this is a, a service hosted by Bitzer Germany. It enables your IQ modules to connect uh, with Germany where these modules can be monitored and the same information can be collected and reported back to a technician, for example, a designated technician um, to say, hey, there's there's something going on. This system is, has uh, tripped on, on oil failure. Um, and maybe then uh, the technician go in and, and check the status, log into the digital network and, and see how that compressor has been doing um, if, the, if subscribed to, the, to the, the service. And in this case, then they can go in and, and see, yeah, oh yeah, I see this compressor has tripped uh, a number of times in the last few days. Something's changed. Maybe my expansion valve is feeding too much liquid. Um, or something else is, is going on. So in summary, uh, basically the IQ module is something that looks after a lot of things for us. It greatly simplifies the wiring, controls all of the, uh, uh, the um, accessories. Okay, any accessories that you would need with a compressor can be controlled by the, uh, the IQ module, including starting up, you know, the part wind starting, even if it's Y delta, um, it, you know, these kinds of, situation. So the um, oil heater, all this other stuff, everything is, everything can be controlled, as I mentioned before. Then you have the monitoring, all the inputs, uh, discharge sensors, your pressure transducers, uh, monitors, the, um, the envelope, uh, the compressor to ensure that it's within the envelope, you know, for that particular compressor, using that particular refrigerant, um, it will look after all of this for us. Um, and we believe that, uh, you know, the installation time commissioning time kind of going through this backwards, right. But reducing the installation time commissioning time, for sure. You saw the module, the way you connect the terminals to it, you know, this is uh, my, my first unloader. I'm going to designate this unloader number one, connect that to CR two dash one and neutral on the, um, on the control module. It's, it's that simple. Uh, so all of the inputs are labeled according to the accessory that would be connected to them. And also according to the, the um, input sensor, whether it's an oil switch or discharge temperature sensor, pressure transducers, what have you, they're all labeled to accommodate these, uh, these input type sensors. Gives the uh, technician uh, quick access to information about the compressor, very important information about how it's been running. Why is it not running right now? in the case of a trip, um, which can really save some time in terms of diagnosing uh, failures and whatnot. And for more information on the IQ module, you can uh, feel free to visit the Bitzer website. This is at 
www.bitzer, of course, B-I-T-Z-E-R dot C-A, okay? And then when you go to the website, um, you, can, you can browse for um, the uh, IQ module or type in the IQ module by model number, which is the um, uh, CMRC01. So control module, reciprocating compressor, first version. Um, and there's different uh, technical information booklets for each category of compressor, depending on which type of compressor that you have. Alternatively, you can just contact um, uh, one of us at Bitzer and, uh, and we'd be happy to send you some more information on this. And in the best software, as I mentioned, there's information about alarms, uh, the firmware, you use the best software to, uh, uh, to update the firmware, um, you know, if and when these are available. As they come out, you can update the uh, IQ module. Any release notes that you need to know about is all actually included in the best software. You just have to keep your best software up to date. It'll help keep you up to date and keep your module up to date. Okay, so that's uh, that would be it for the presentation. I, I did have to I did have to trim it down a little bit just to, for the sake of time and want to leave a bit of time for questions. So uh, on that note, I'll I'll open up the floor to any questions that might exist or may have been asked that I haven't seen yet. No, no worries, uh, Phil. Um, so we have about seven questions to get through, and I was, we got about five minutes left, and I'm just wondering if we if we can't get through uh, all these questions. What we might do is um, uh, I'll have Phil kind of go through the questions and write them, write answers, and we'll send it out to the group here. Um, uh, Trevor Matthews has a, a slew of questions, so. <laughs> Of course and, he does. Yeah. And I have, so I'll, I'll start with the first one. Uh, it says here when the IQ module is in condensing unit outside below um, minus 22 Fahrenheit, what could happen? And do you recommend heaters in the condensing unit? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a, a yeah, because the compressor has a compressed uh, crankcase heater on it, but um, the IQ module will be installed inside the, uh, the terminal box. So that's a good point. I mean, the module, um, and I forget exactly what the temperature is um, off the top of my head, but in the event that uh, the ambient temperature can drop below the minimum allowable by the module, it may be necessary to, uh, to have some kind of auxiliary heater or something like that. Um, actually, uh, don't recall what the, uh, what the value was there. I think it was one of these earlier slides here. Here it is. Yeah, see, so minus 22 Fahrenheit. In some cases, you can, you know, we can experience temperatures that are even lower than that. Now, compressors that normally are, you know, they're in normal operation, never really have a chance to cool down a whole lot. I mean, they're, the, the terminal box is installed above the motor. The motor's got some heat in it. I mean, it's been working. And for a compressor that operates through normal uh, run cycles, uh, it's probably not going to be an issue. Uh, most of the time, but it, it's a good point, something that, that should be considered. And I would say that when you run into applications where the module could be in, installed in extreme cold um, uh, to contact us and, uh, and we can discuss the application and come up with some solutions for that. And this is a characteristic of, you know, with electronics for sure. So good question. Okay, we have another one. Can you program it to, uh, can you program it using Bluetooth or just the RS485 cable? Uh, and computer? Another good question. We, we were able to program in the past, you can only program it via the, uh, the physical connection via wire. But um, since then, um, the technology has been updated so that you can actually program it via Bluetooth also. Okay. Uh, can the IQ module be networked to a rack or a facility controller? It can be absolutely networked to a rack. Um, any, any rack controller that uh, can connect to the module via Modbus. And I would say most, if not all rack manufacturers are pretty, pretty comfortable with the, uh, with the process, or I hope they are. Um, and if not, we can help them out with it anyways. Um, as you saw, I've, I've written some Modbus on my own. And uh, frankly, that was the first time I had ever done it in my life. <laughs> so it, okay. is, it is doable, but the central control system would need to be configured for that. But it certainly can. But it, Modbus does not have to be used, just to be clear. If it's a central control system like a rack, then um, you can simply use a digital output 
to start your compressor. So we basically give the compressor a run call right here on Relay C. Convenient that we have this slide back up. And then it will start the compressor. And uh, then in that case, you would have to provide an analog signal if you have unloaders to control the, uh, the unloaders on, on the compressor, if you're using unloaders. If not, you don't have to do that. You just give it a run call and the module will control all the accessories. But now your rack controller doesn't have to worry about all the accessories and that, that are tied into the compressor. The module looks after that for you. Okay, we have four more questions. I think we might go over about five minutes here. So if you wanna stick around and listen, that's great. Uh, we have uh, another uh, question. Uh, if you mix up the solenoid on the IQ module, what would happen when unloading and would the compressor overheat? If you mix up the solenoids, uh, no, because the, so if, let's say you've got a four cylinder compressor and you've got set up, it's set up to operate from 10 to 100%. Um, so you have a CR1 and CR2 are connected to here. These are the outputs for the solenoid coils. It would really make no difference um, whether you've got your wire for CR2 connected to this or that compressor. Um, but I will say this, when you're applying an IQ module, um, it's always, of course, very important to look at the operating instructions in the event that there's any notes in there about you know, which unloader, which head should be unloaded first, because you may run into this in, in some cases. But uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, unloading one head versus the other generally is not gonna create any issue, so. Okay, we have three more questions. Uh, one, uh, is there an EEV valve option for refrigerant injection or just solenoid and TREV valve? Sorry, I, I don't know if it's TREV or TERV, so. I'll, I'll let you answer that, Phil. Um, okay, so if you were to apply an electronic expansion valve, what you're basically trying to do in that case is take control of the refrigerant injection. The purpose of the IQ module is to take control of all the accessories and protect the compressor based on uh, algorithms that have been uh, tested by Bitzer for long periods of time. And so we don't offer this as an option, and this, this is why. So there's basically a solenoid valve, there's a, an orifice, or an injection orifice that will meter the refrigerant. You could say it to some extent, it atomizes the refrigerant. As soon as you put an electronic expansion valve on there, you're trying to control based on superheat and, and that's what we're not trying to do here. So uh, that's not available. Okay, we have two more questions. Um, would this IQ module essentially replace the need for boards in control panels when using master controller like site supervisor or E2 on a panel, uh, on a parallel system? Okay, I'm not 100% sure what the question's asking, but I'll take a stab at it. If you're referring to an output board um, from a rack controller or something like that, you still need that because this controller, um, this is, it's, I think it's important to highlight that this is not a system controller, it's a compressor controller. All you have to do is tell the, com the controller you want that compressor to run, and then the, the controller, the IQ module will actually control the accessories, as I've said before, and monitor the inputs. But it doesn't take over any other control of the system. So you, you're still gonna need a relay output board in your main system controller, because we have to provide a run call signal to what we call relay C terminal on the CN2 block here. Okay, so then the C, once there's a signal received here, the module uh, regards that as a, as a call for cooling, and then it will determine what type of starting method is, is set in the software and determine how to cycle contactors uh, on to bring the compressor online. So you still need that output. So I don't know if that answers the question, but Okay, uh, and we've got one last question. Uh, how many days will the operating data be saved and how often is it trended? Um, it depends, like alarms and that are saved for uh, a year. So you, you, 365 days for alarms, events like solenoids turning on and off are generally 30 days and data um, generally uh, one to three weeks. So the idea is this isn't, the IQ module um, is not meant to be a data logger, although it is, it's a data logger, but it just enables you to go back in time in the event that there were some 
some failures and diagnostics and you know that need to be done. It gives you some history for a reasonable period of time. What's been going on in the last few weeks that this compressor was running that got us to this point today. So with the data, there's a lot of inputs uh, being fed to that, your pressure transducers, um, and these are being monitored. I believe it's every, yeah, every three seconds, uh, information is timestamped, pressures, temperatures, uh, all sorts of information. Um, uh, so that's why the, you know, the, the, the timing is not so long. If you wanted full-fledged data logging, then you go to a different type of uh, system and you probably tie that into the entire rack, if it's a rack. All right, then. Well, I think this concludes the session. We've answered uh, any questions. If anyone has any um, uh, uh, further questions, you can certainly reach out to Phil um, and feel free to reach out to me directly if, if you can't uh, find Phil's uh, information. Uh, thank you again, Phil. I really do appreciate you taking the time today to take us through um, this session and uh, looking forward to, uh, to um, seeing you in a couple of weeks, I believe. Very good. Well, thank you, okay. Loretta. And thank you everyone for attending. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.